Welcome. Today, we are going to pull back the curtain on a subject that, let's be honest, affects pretty much every part of our lives, from your morning coffee to massive government decisions. We're going to learn how to think like an economist. So let's just jump right in with a big question. When you hear an economist talking on the news, are you listening to a scientist who's just laying out the objective facts? Or are you hearing a storyteller, someone trying to sell you on their particular vision of the world? Well, the truth is, it's a little bit of both. Okay, let's get into this. Economists basically wear two different hats. With one hat on, they're explaining the world just as it is. But with the other hat, they're trying to make it better. And you know, understanding this split is the absolute key to making sense of all those economic debates we hear about. Think about it like this. The economist as a scientist is kind of like a map maker. They're just describing the terrain. Here are the mountains, here are the rivers, here's what the land looks like. But the economist as a policy advisor, that's more like a city planner. They look at that same map and say, you know what, we should build a bridge right here, or this whole area ought to be a park. One describes what is, the other prescribes what should be. So let's stick with that map maker role for a minute. When economists are acting as scientists, they really do use the scientific method, just like a biologist or a physicist would. They come up with theories, they collect data, and they analyze that data to see if their ideas actually hold water. But how do you even run an experiment on something as huge and messy as the entire economy? I mean, you can't just stick it in a test tube, right? This is where their secret weapon comes in. Assumptions. Economists have to simplify the world on purpose, just to filter out all the noise and focus on what's really driving the thing they're trying to understand. And that leads us to their most important tool, the economic model. Now, a model isn't the real world, of course. No more than a flight simulator is a real airplane but it's an incredibly powerful simplification that helps us get a handle on how complex real-world situations actually work. So to make this a little less abstract, let's look at two of the most basic fundamental models in all of economics. They might look simple at first glance, but trust me, they show us some really profound things about how our economy ticks. First up, we've got this circular flow diagram. You can think of this as the economy's basic blueprint. It's a super simple visual that just shows how money and goods are constantly flowing back and forth between the two main players in any economy. And who are those players? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It's us. We're the households. And the businesses we buy stuff from. The firms. We sell things like our labor to firms, and they pay us income. Then, what do we do? We take that income, and we spend it on the goods and services that those very same firms produce. It's this continuous circular loop of earning and spending. Okay, our second model is called the Production Possibilities Frontier. It's a bit of a mouthful, I know, so let's just call it the PPF. Now, this one does a brilliant job of showing one of the toughest truths in economics, scarcity. It's basically a graph that shows the absolute maximum an economy can produce, and in doing so, it reveals the tough choices and trade-offs that every single society has to face. And this is where that abstract idea becomes totally concrete. Just imagine a country that only makes two things airplanes, and soybeans. Look at the numbers. They can make 5,000 tons of soybeans if they make zero airplanes. Or they can make 100 airplanes if they make zero soybeans. Or, of course, some combination in between. The big takeaway here is this. To get more of one, you have to give up some of the other. There's no way around it. Now, when we actually graph those possibilities, we get this curve. Any point that's right on that curve means the economy is running at 100% efficiency. It's firing on all cylinders. Any point inside the curve means something's wrong. It's being inefficient. Maybe there's a ton of unemployment, for example. And any point outside the curve? Well, that's just plain impossible with what they've got right now. So let me ask you a quick question. Looking at that frontier, could this country produce 80 airplanes and 4,000 tons of soybeans? The answer, of course, is a hard no. That combination is way outside the frontier. To get to those 80 airplanes, they'd have to slash soybean production all the way down to just 1,000 tons. That right there is the trade-off in action. Okay, so that's the economist wearing the scientist hat, using these models to describe what is possible. But that scientific understanding is usually just the beginning. Now let's see how that informs their other role, the policy advisor, the one who talks about what an economy ought to do. This brings us to a really, really critical distinction positive versus normative statements. A positive statement is all about description. It's a claim about how the world is, and this is key, it can be tested with data. A normative statement, on the other hand, is prescriptive. It's a claim about how the world should be, and it's always based on values and opinions. 
Okay, so check out this statement. Minimum wage laws cause unemployment. Now, whether you think this is true or false doesn't actually matter. What matters is that we can test it. We can go out, gather the data, run the numbers, and see what the evidence says. That makes it a positive statement. Now, compare that to this. The government should raise the minimum wage. See that magic word in there, should? That's a dead giveaway. This isn't a statement of fact that we can test. It's a statement of values. It's a policy prescription. It is a classic normative statement. You know, this whole distinction really helps us answer a very common question. If economics is supposed to be a science, why do economists seem to disagree all the time? It feels like you can always find one to argue the complete opposite of another, right? Well, it turns out most of those disagreements really just boil down to two main reasons. First, they might just have different scientific judgments. They might disagree on a positive theory of how the world actually works. Or second, and this happens all the time, they just have different values. They have different normative ideas about what the goal of a policy should even be in the first place. But here's the thing. While all their disagreements make for great headlines, the reality is on a whole bunch of core issues, there is a shocking amount of agreement among economists. How much agreement? Well, let's just look at a number, 93%. So what on earth could 93% of economists possibly agree on? This statement right here. Tariffs and import quotas usually reduce general economic welfare. Think about that. Even though this is debated endlessly in politics, among the people who study this for a living, it's pretty much a settled question. And it's not just tariffs. As you can see, there's a massive consensus on other really controversial issues too. Things like rent ceilings hurting housing supply, or that restricting outsourcing is a bad idea, or that we should probably get rid of agricultural subsidies. The perception of disagreement is often way, way bigger than the reality. So we end right back where we started, with the economist's two roles, the scientist and the advisor. Which leaves a final question for you to think about. The next time you hear someone giving economic advice, just ask yourself, which hat is that person wearing? Are they the scientist, just describing reality? Or are they the advisor, trying to shape it? And maybe more importantly, which one should we be listening to?